You have questions? The Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Phillips Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Welcome, friends, to a Bible answer. I'm Mike McDaniel, the evangelist of the Central Church of Christ in Carothersville, Missouri. Thanks for watching a Bible answer. We've got three gospel preachers. They've been doing a wonderful job answering your questions, and we'll have them introduce themselves to you once again. I'm Mike Tucker. I preach at the Northside Church of Christ in Mayfield, Kentucky, meeting at 711 Hausman Street. My name is David Gulledge. I work and serve with the Whitlock Church of Christ in Paris, Tennessee. I'm Nat Evans. I preach for the Hickory Grove Church of Christ in Callaway County, Kentucky. We're glad these good brethren could be with us today. We're very happy for the great questions that have been sent in. We want to encourage you today to send us your good Bible questions. We're always in need of them. Here at a Bible Answer, and at the halfway point of our program, and again at the end, you'll see our contact information where you can send us your Bible question. Now to our questions for today. We've got quite a few good questions. Our first one goes to Brother Evans. Brother Evans, Jesus' opposers accused him of making himself equal to God. John 5, 18, John 10, 30 through 33. However, they say, isn't it true that Jesus never claimed to be on the same level as Almighty God? He said, the Father is greater than I am. John 14, 28. We'll give that to you, Brother Evans. We call attention, first of all, to John 5, 18 for the first verse. For this cause, therefore, the Jews sought the more to kill him because... He not only break the Sabbath, but also call God his own Father, making himself equal with God. Now, if you'll carefully read the entire book of John and notice the words and the works of Jesus, you will note especially that Jesus beginning with the very first three verses of the book of John, Jesus is God, that is, He is deity. He's one of the members of the Godhead. The querist must notice that verse 17 in John 5 comes before verse 18. Jesus before by His teaching and miracles had proved that He was from God. He had claimed equality with God. And that's why because of his identification with the Heavenly Father, the Jews became very upset and accused him of blasphemy. As you get to John 10:30 30 and 31, where Jesus said, I, in verse 30, I and the Father are one. The Jews took up stones again to stone him. And Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from the Father, for which of these works do you stone me? And the Jews answered him, For good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because that thou being of man makest thyself God. You see, they knew exactly what was taking place and what his claims were. Why can't these uh, people of our day, the modernists, and those who deny the deity of Christ, read the book of John carefully and see exactly what Jesus' claims were. And then, John 14, 28, Ye heard how I said to you, I go away and come unto you. If ye love me, you would have rejoiced, because I go unto the Father, for the Father is greater than I. It is important to recognize that all the statements in the sacred writings, such as his Father was greater than he, he came to do his own will, but not to do his own will, but the will of his Father. He proceeded from the Father, and not the Father from him. His Father knew some things he did not, or all to be understood as referring to the time when he was in the flesh. You see, if you'll read Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, Jesus existed as a spirit being in heaven, 
on an equality with the Father, but decided to surrender that equality in order to leave heaven and in order to take on human flesh for the purposes of accomplishing the scheme of redemption in order that he might die on the cross. You can't kill the spirit. You couldn't kill deity, but you can kill human flesh. So Jesus, in order to accomplish the scheme of redemption, to die for us on the cross, took on the limitations of human flesh. And therefore, while in human flesh, could make that statement, the Father is greater than I. And therefore, that is the meaning of John 14, 28. Now, there are several areas that I do not have time to go into. Old Testament prophecy helps us to establish the deity of Christ. Isaiah 7, 14, in connection with Matthew 1 and verse 21 to 23, where Jesus was to be Emmanuel. The Bible clearly states in Matthew 1, 23, that's exactly what he was. Well, what does inspiration say the word Emmanuel means? God with us. So that's what Jesus was. Isaiah 9, 6, he was to be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, literally in the Hebrew, Father of Eternity. So Jesus is an eternal being. He was in the Spirit, but of course in the flesh. He had a beginning through the process of the virgin birth. Prince of Peace, Micah 5, 2. He's existed from all eternity. And then also indirect prophecies establish that he is deity. Then his equality with God is claimed in Scripture. 45, Isaiah, uh, rather Psalms 45, verse 6, together with Hebrews 1, verses 6 through 8. The attributes of deity are ascribed to Christ. His, the eternal nature of Christ is affirmed in Scripture. The prerogatives of deity are ascribed to Christ. He was the creator. He created all things. He's not a created being. He forgives sins, only a prerogative of God. Mark 2, 5, Mark 2, 7. He accepted worship, which only God can do. You need to recognize that. The titles of deity are ascribed to Christ. He is called God, Lord. Even the title of Jehovah, you will study the scriptures carefully, will find is given to Christ. Then he's the King of kings and Lord of lords, Revelation 19, 11 to 16. His words and his works Establish his deity. And then I'll close with this. The Greek New Testament. Ten times in the Greek New Testament, Jesus is called God. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Brother Evans. To Brother Tucker. Here were the sons and daughters of men in Genesis 6 and verse 2. Brother Tucker. I want to begin by reading the text. We'll start with verse 1 of Genesis 6. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the ground, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them for wives of all they chose. Well, there's some possibilities that you and I can quickly eliminate as to who were these sons and daughters. The sons of God were not angels. Because angels, the Bible describes as being beings that have no sex. There's no male or female. Matthew 22 and verse 30, In the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as angels in heaven. So we know they weren't angels. Also, in all fairness, the sons of God, that phrase, is sometimes used in describing angels, as in Job chapter 2 and verse 1. It's also used as describing the Jews, Hosea 1 and verse 10. So we understand that the word term sons of God can be used a number of different ways. I like what Matthew Henry says in his commentary as he explains, speaking of mixed marriages in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 2, 
the sons of God, that is, the professors of religion, who were called by the name of the Lord and called upon that name, those sons of God married the daughters of men, that is, those who were profane and strangers to God and to godliness. That's an unequally equal yoking as we're warned against in 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 14. God forbade His people from marrying outsiders who would turn their hearts away from God. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 3 and 4. The German Old Testament scholar who wrote with Kyle, this man by the name of Delitzsch, explains intermarriages of the Seth and Canaanite families did take place about the time of the flood. In Matthew 28 and verse 38, Luke chapter 17, verse 27, both of these prohibit mixed marriages under the law. And Exodus chapter 34 and verse 16 also reflects the same way of thinking. The text immediately following the passage about the sons of, of God marrying the daughters of men, remember... It's followed by God's divine cleansing of the world in Noah's day. The reason? Because of man's wickedness. The sons of God marrying the daughters of men was a mixing of those who were striving to be righteous after God's commandments, marrying those who had no thought, no pretense of being concerned about God and doing what's right. And that's what, that, how that phrase should be understood. I hope that'll be a help to the one asking the question. Thank you, Brother Tucker. I think that's exactly right. I recently uh, taught that passage in the auditorium class from the book of Genesis. You know, if those angels were, if those were angels, then they were fallen ones, and as such, they would no longer be sons of God. They would be sons of the devil. And uh, angels, as is said, are spirit beings. And they do not consist of flesh, so they're incapable of a physical relationship. Jesus himself plainly said, they do not marry. And if the sons of God were angels, how did the flood serve as a judgment upon them? Obviously not. Good answer. We've reached the halfway point of our program today. We want to offer to you a free tract. Our tract today is the second coming of Christ and the millennium. This tract will answer a lot of questions that people have about the second coming of Christ. There's a lot of false theories taught about it. This will reveal to you what the Bible teaches on the subject. If you'd like to have the tract or the correspondence course or both, just let us know. You can contact us by writing us at Phillips Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillips Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. You can email us at a Bible answer at earthlink.net, or you can call our toll-free number. Now, if you call the toll-free number and get the answer machine, it is absolutely essential that you leave not a telephone number, but that you leave your address, your full mailing address, in a good, clear voice, so that we can understand it and, and meet your request. That number is 1-800-436-0463. And at the end of our program today, you'll see this uh, information once again, on the uh, screen now is our web address, www.abibleanswertv.com. We encourage you to go to our website as well. You know, we have a lot of viewers around the world who watch a Bible answer by means of our website. They go there and uh, look at uh, the different questions that are involved in the different programs from uh, past episodes. We have well over 500 episodes of a Bible answer that have been recorded. Some of the questions that we've dealt with recently have come from uh, people in other parts of the United States and sometimes even around the world. We recently answered a series of questions uh, from young people in Nigeria who watch a Bible answer online. Back to our questions today to Brother Gullage. We have this question. Did Jesus cleanse a temple once or twice? Brother Gulledge. Thank you so much for the question. <clears throat> it seems as though through 
a study of the four gospel accounts that Jesus cleansed the temple twice. If we were to turn, first of all, to John, John is the only one of the four gospels that records the first time that the Lord cleansed the temple. So I want us to notice these two different occasions. First of all, in John chapter 2. Now remember, the, the other three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, don't record this, only John. But, so if we were to turn to John chapter 2, we read about after Jesus had performed His very first miracle at a wedding in Cana. It says in verses 11 and 12, this being of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested His glory, and His disciples believed in Him. Now, now notice the travel that Jesus does here. In verse 11, He's in Cana of Galilee. Verse 12, After this He went down to Capernaum, He, His mother, and His brothers, and His disciples, and they did not stay there many days. And so He goes from Cana of Galilee to Capernaum. Then verse 13, now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went to Jerusalem. So within three verses, we see Jesus going from Cana, Cana of Galilee to Capernaum, then to Jerusalem to observe the Passover. In verse 14, and he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. And when he had made a whip of cords, he drove them out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured the changers' money, and overturned the tables. And he said unto those who sold doves, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. And so here on the first occasion, we see that Jesus goes from Cana of Galilee to Capernaum, then over to Jerusalem to observe the Passover. And there he goes into the temple and he sees... Um, the, the selling of merchandise of doves and oxen, and, and he makes a, a whip out of cords. He, he, he braids them together and he drives them out and he cleanses the temple on this first occasion. And, and so we see this in John chapter 2. Now note that this is the very beginning of the Lord's ministry. He has been baptized um, uh, of John the Baptist and, and he has just began his his ministry, he's called his disciples, and, and he's gone and performed the first miracle, and now he's beginning his ministry, and he cleanses the temple. So then if we look at the second cleansing of the temple, which occurred just after Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem during the last week of his life. And so here we have the first cleansing during the beginning of his ministry, and then the second cleansing of the temple will take place during the last week of the Lord's life uh, as he enters his triumphal entry into Jerusalem upon the back of a donkey and there he will go and later cleanse the temple a second time. This is also the second account of the cleansing is not found in John. It's ironic that John records the first cleansing, the other three don't, the other three record the second cleansing and John doesn't. But if we look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, well, we see a second time where Jesus cleansed the temple. If you were to turn over with me to Matthew chapter 21, we would see where Jesus would cleanse the temple a second time. Matthew chapter 21, beginning in verse 1, we see the Lord's triumphal entry. Starting in verse 12, then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers uh, uh, and the seats of those who sold doves. And He said unto them, It is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, not made into a den of thieves. And so here the Lord goes in to the temple and He drives them out again, cleansing the temple for a second time. Now if we notice some differences in the two cleansings, um, there, there are differences in the two events uh, from their being nearly three years apart, first of all. But, uh, but also in, in the first occasion we see that the temple officials confronted Jesus immediately. In John 2 and verse 8, as soon as Jesus cleansed the temple, immediately following the temple uh, officials confronted Jesus, whereas in the second cleansing, they waited until the next day, the following day, Matthew 21, 17-23, to approach Jesus. In the first event, we see that Jesus made a whip of cords, which He drove out the sellers. But in 
the second cleansing, there is no mention uh, of any uh, whip mentioned there within the text. And so we, we can see some, different, uh, so, some differences within the two events when Jesus first cleansed it and when he cleansed it for the second time. And so there are two recorded occasions when the Lord did cleanse the temple the first time at the beginning of his ministry, the second time just after his triumphal entry into Jerusalem shortly before our Lord was to be crucified. And I hope that answers your question. Thank you for that good answer to a very good question. Now we have another question for Brother Evans. Brother Evans, what were the keys of the kingdom? Brother Evans. The scripture the person is inquiring about is located in Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 and 19. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, that means son of Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father who is in heaven I and I also say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. The church, of verse 18, and the kingdom, of verse 19, mean one and the same thing. For why would Jesus promise to build one thing, and yet promise to give the apostles keys to an entirely different institution? The church emphasizes the called out feature of God's people, while the kingdom stresses the governmental, governmental aspect of it. Now, the keys of the kingdom means that Peter would be given the privilege of opening the doors of the kingdom or the church, which he did both to the Jewish people on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, and to the Gentiles at Caesarea in Acts chapter 10 at the household of Cornelius. But he also shared this responsibility with the other apostles, Acts chapter 2, verse 14, Acts 2, verse 37, and Matthew chapter 18 and verse 18. His apostolic authority was not above theirs, Matthew 19, 28, 2 Peter 3, 2, and Acts 2, 14. On one occasion, the apostle Paul rebuked Peter to the face before them all because Peter stood condemned. Upon another occasion, Peter was sent with John on a mission by the church at Jerusalem and the other apostles. Notice it was the church at Jerusalem and not the church at Rome. But to answer the question in short order, it is simply the preaching of the gospel that opens the door of the kingdom, telling people what to do to be saved, Acts 2.38. On Pentecost, when the gospel was preached, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Notice Peter didn't say, There's not anything you can do. But Peter said unto them, Repent ye and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, under the remission of your sins. The King James Version says, For the remission of your sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And with many other words, verse 40, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward or crooked generation. So there was something they could do themselves. They had responsibility. Verse 41, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and there were added unto them in that day about 3,000 souls. Verse 47, Praising God and having favor with all the people, the Lord added to them in that day about 3,000 souls. Now, the Lord added to them day by day those that were saved. The King James translation says, He added them to the church. So, the binding and loosing here found here indicates that their word regarding salvation and condemnation would be fully honored in heaven because they were speaking by inspiration and because the things they were speaking had already been bound in heaven according to the original Greek found in the text. Now, so the keys is simply the teaching of the gospel, which Peter used, and also the other apostles, Matthew 18, verse 18. And I thank you for the question. We have a limited amount of time, but we'll give this question to you, Brother Tucker. Please explain Galatians 3 and verse 1. Brother Tucker. 
Galatians 3 and verse 1 reads, O foolish Galatians, who did bewitch you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was openly set forth and crucified? The word foolish means to fail to use your power of perception. It's not being stupid. It's not that you don't have the ability. You're just not using your ability. The word bewitch so often has reference to bringing evil on someone by praise deceitfully, or by some kind of evil charm, so to speak, an evil eye. Well, Paul's not acknowledging the reality of magical powers, but figuratively he's talking about those who pervert things that a person should be able to reason from reasonably. And it's been openly set forth, that is, before whose eyes Jesus Christ, the new King James says, was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. In other words, the message has been put forth, not in a hidden way, but as if it was put on a billboard. It's really the idea as a father would give legal notice. He's formerly been responsible for his son, but he gives legal notice. I'm no longer responsible for my son's debts. It's not anything hidden or secret. Well, by implication, the Galatians should have been motivated by the cross to be anchored to Christ, and instead they were drifting away. That's why Paul said earlier in the book, Galatians 1 verses 6 through 8, that he was, he absolutely marveled that they had so quickly been removed from the gospel that they had received by some foreign, some different sort of gospel. So those foolish Galatians who were bewitched just hadn't used the good sense God had given them that they had already received, and they were adrift. We appreciate that question. It's sad to see people in that situation, isn't it? Who know what to do, know the truth of the gospel, and yet they have wandered away from it. And Jesus talked about that in the parable of the sower, how that uh, people can be on fire for the Lord one minute and yet go astray from Him the next. But we're thankful for those who maintain their steadfastness to the Lord and to His cause. And we're so very thankful for you today for watching a Bible answer. And we hope that the good answers that these good men have given to your questions has helped you to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We hope that it's been a blessing to you. We hope that you'll tell others about it. Remember, friends, for your Bible questions, there's always a Bible answer. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for a Bible answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with the faithful Church of Christ in your area.